Welcome to Activate with Pastor Christian Newsom, a podcast of Journey Church International. Thanks for listening to the Activate podcast with Pastor Christian Newsom. I am Pastor Christian. We are so grateful um, to have you with us today. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, welcome. We're glad that you're with us. For those of you who might just be listening um, on your favorite podcast platform, we have with us today um, a couple guests, Daniel and Brittany Brooker from the Atlanta suburbs. My wife, Danielle, um, is also here too. Uh, And we are dropping a special podcast today for the holiday season called Hurt Hope um, and blended families for the holidays. Uh, so we're really glad that you're listening. For those of you who are maybe brand new, someone shared this with you because of your season in life. Uh, my name's Christian. I'm the pastor at Journey Church International in Lee Summit, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City. And this platform for nearly five years was used to talk about how to practically um, begin to activate what the Bible teaches in the life of a Jesus follower in your everyday life. Um, if you want, you have time over the next several years. You can go back and listen to old episodes. We have transitioned this platform to just trying to give practical advice once a month for people walking through life who want to learn how to walk through um, with the love of Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the practical tools of scriptures, um, and the stories of Jesus followers. And that's what today is as we kind of dig into this episode. Um, you're going to meet, for those of you watching on YouTube, you're looking at them. For those of you listening, you're going to meet Daniel and Brittany Brooker, um, who both lost their spouses young. Brittany's husband, Patrick, died when she was 25, uh, leaving her with three kids under three and a pretty new baby. Um, Daniel's wife, Lindsay, um, died when he was 30 and she was 28, leaving him with two kids under five. And a couple years later, they became um, a blended family uh, and have just recently added number six to that mix. Um, And they are some of our favorite people. If you want to hear more of their story, you can just Google their names, Daniel and Brittany Brooker. Follow them on social media. You'll be able to hear lots and lots of content for how they walk through that season in life, how they're walking through this season in their life. Um, But today's podcast is very specifically, as we get ready for Christmas and New Year's of 2022, or whatever year you might be listening to this, um, how to deal with hurt, how to deal with Uh, how to find hope, um, and how to be a healthy blended family over the holiday season. So Daniel and Brittany, thank you so much uh, for being here, racing straight from the airport because the rental car business is awful (laughs) nine times out of 10. Um, I just want, so I want to jump right in. There are people listening to this podcast um, who are getting ready to experience their first Christmas and their first New Year's without somebody very, very close to them. Um, my grandfather has died this year. My mom and her sisters getting ready to experience their first Christmas without their dad. Um, Danielle's grandmother and grandfather has died this year. Her grandfather just had um, his funeral two days ago. Her entire family is getting ready to walk through uh, the holiday season for the first time. And we know every year um, there are people who move through their first Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's uh, without somebody who has never not been there. Um, I know we're jumping right into the deep end fast. I'll let both of you answer this. How, with your kids, um, with your own heart, how, how did you fall asleep that first Christmas Eve knowing that you were going to get up and try to have a celebration, um, with a really, really, really heavy heart? Um, and, and how would you speak to people who are walking, walking into that over the next two weeks as we approach Christmas? We jumped in the deep end. <laughs> Christian, I, I remember that very first Christmas um, is tough. And if you're, if you're in that season, if this is going to be your first holiday in that place, I'm, I'm just sorry. I mean, it is, it is not fun to be there. It's not easy. There's not really anything I can say that will make it better. Um, but I do know that one of the things that helped me was surrounding myself with people that really cared, really loved me, and were going to help me through it. You know, someone can tell you it's going to be okay, but you would rather them just keep showing up for you until you can say it. And that, that was the blessing that I had in that season. People just showed up and they stayed in the pain, in the hard parts. And when you have that kind of relationship and somebody that just is for you and your kids especially, it gives you a little more confidence to keep going. 
you don't you don't want to let them down. You don't want to um, you don't want to not show. So it gives you the incentive to get out of bed, to get things together, to put the presents out, or whatever the case is, and and be there. And if you have that little bit of courage that's borrowed, I think it can continue to snowball from there. But it's not going to be easy. It can be sweet, but it's going to be bitter for sure. Yep. And it's the relationships that remind you of truths that you really can't speak over your life, maybe even in that first season. Right. Brittany, take us back to that first Christmas for you, um, a widowed mom of three under three. Um, how, how did you survive that first uh, holiday walking through the pain that you were in? Yeah, I think that's a key word right there survive. You're not going to thrive your first season. It's hard. And you're walking through unbearable pain. And I think giving yourself the grace that this, this season's going to look different. And I can't put the pressure on myself that I would normally have of making all these special magical things happen for my kids. And I had to literally just sit in the pain and ask God to meet me there. But I will tell you my first Christmas, um, I remember sitting there on Christmas Eve, putting things in their stockings by myself and just feeling how deep it was. Um, and I thought, this is why we have Christmas is because Emmanuel came down to be God with us in the pain. And I experienced the just amazing gift of the presence of God in the midst of our deepest pain, we can experience his presence in a deeper way. And so for me, I felt the magic of Christmas in a different way than I'd ever experienced. Because I thought this is why Christmas is so important because Jesus came down to earth to feel all the pain so he could be the great high priest who intercedes on behalf, knowing what it felt like to lose people, knowing how it felt like to have the sting and the pain of death and he came to say, you don't have to do this by yourself. I came to carry you. And so I tried to really press into the hope of what that is, the hope that I'm not doing this alone. It felt lonely, and I was doing the practical thing as alone, but I'm telling you, I was not alone in that house. The presence of God surrounded. And so I would say so many times we try to fill the pain with other things, and I could have had all kinds of friends over that offered, but sometimes you just need to feel the pain and let God enter that and meet you right there in the midst and open his word and say, God, would you meet me here? So I do think giving grace and then also allowing yourself to say, God, just meet me here in the midst and praise him. You know, we adore God for his character in so many areas. And so adore God from that lonely place. Say, God, I adore you because you are Emmanuel God with us, that you are the mighty God. You came to be give us peace. You are the prince of peace in the midst of chaos, in the midst of unwanted circumstances and praise him from that dark place. That's what a sacrifice of praise is, is worshiping when it hurts, when it is a sacrifice. And that is powerful. Worship is our weapon and that helps us to press into hope during the hard holidays. One of the things I love about um, stories is sometimes, sometimes they fill in some practical gaps where there's not a Bible verse or a promise, yep. or biblical truth. So I'll, I'll ask you a question knowing that the answer is not biblical truth, but knowing that your experience um, can, can maybe shape someone else's experience. Um, what did you say or do to acknowledge for your kids that first Christmas morning, um, that first New Year's, uh, that first Father's Day, Mother's Day, what did you do to acknowledge the absence of the hurt? Did you do nothing? Um, again, I know there's, there's not a biblically prescribed right or wrong way, but what did you do that felt that in the Holy Spirit in you felt right? Yeah. Uh, and maybe what did you do that, you, you, that felt wrong that you wouldn't do for those who are trying to figure that out? Yeah, I think um, there's no, everyone's going to do it different. And for us, I talk about Patrick every day, you know, so it's not like, oh, we just talk about him for the holidays or we just honor him during the holidays. He is a part of our life and everything. And we honor that position. We will always honor that. And so um, we, you know, spent intentional time. We always reflect, you know, God's word always reminds us to reflect on God's faithfulness. And I think reflecting on people's lives and the goodness of God in the midst of that is so important. So for holidays, we always set aside time where we reflect, what are your favorite memories with daddy on Christmas? What do you wish you could tell him on his birthday? Let's make him a card. And making sure that we are taking time to walk them through that 
Kids are different than adults. They bounce in and out of grief. You know, Danielle just lost her grandpa, so she's not going to walk through any part of this Christmas without thinking about her grandpa. But a kid would would stop. Sometimes they'll be playing, laughing, they're fine. Another minute, they'll be crying. And it, you're like, wow, this is kind of psycho emotions. <laughs> but that's how kids are. And so I think with that, you have to be so intentional to lead their hearts and not force grief, not force pain, but also see where they're at. And we've had holidays that we have asked the kids, what do you guys want this to look like? How do you think that um, Daddy Patrick would be honored in this way? What, what do you want this day to look like? And it's different. As they get older, it's different. As they remember more from pictures and they're able to process more, it's different. But I definitely think spending time to honor and, um, and reflect on all God's goodness in the gift that they had that amazing daddy, you know, and that they had that amazing mom and how God, goodness of the Lord in the midst of that. Yeah, and I think, you know, think about a kid's perspective, the anticipation of Christmas, the excitement is almost bigger than that the day in some sense. You know, coming down the stairs to the Christmas presents in grief, we can almost do the same thing. We can build this anticipation of the painful day that we have over, or just kind of like, just we're tense coming into that day and the anticipation can be almost worse than the actual day of grief. And our children will feed off of that energy. So it's acknowledging it. It's definitely allowing the kids to have that conversation. I think one of the things we've gotten right is having the open relationship and conversation with the kids so they feel comfortable sharing that. But we don't want to build anxiety into their holiday. So allowing them to say, we are, we're going to walk into this together. It's not going to be fun in some ways, um, but we're not going to come into it just all worked up over it more than we need to. And kids' hardest grief days are not those holidays. Yeah. My kids' hardest grief days are not holidays. They are the most random days where something triggers them, and my little guy starts weeping, saying, I never got to tell him I love you because I was a baby mm-hmm. when he died. And you sit, and you weep with them, and you hold them, and say, baby, he knew you loved him. And you speak truth, and you say, well, if you could talk to him today, what would you want to tell him? Let's, let's tell him. Let's, yeah. let's talk to Jesus about it. Let's write it in a card. Why don't you draw him a picture? And so I think it's so important to know, like, we put a lot of pressure on those days. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's unhealthy, the days, the pressure. And sometimes they're going to be, they are going to live up to the pressure on those days. And then there's sometimes where it will be the most random day and the tears will just fall and you just have to let them fall. Yeah. So don't, don't let your guard down in those moments, right? It's the Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays that can right. creep in and, yes. and, and right. show up. So I have two questions. Hang on, just before you do that. So for those of you listening to this, it's the week of Christmas, and you for six months or nine months have been building up this day. I just want you to take a deep breath right now. Yeah. Like, just take a deep breath and exhale, um, and don't put all the pressure to get this one day right in the midst of this really hard season. Danielle is, is going to transition us to hope um, in a minute. Before she does that, what great resources might there be out there? People, podcasts, books, blogs that you have found that have taught you some of the things you've just said beyond the scriptures and your church community. Anything off the top of your head that'd be like, yeah, go check that out too. Yeah, a dear friend of ours, uh, the Blackburns, Davey Blackburn, his wife, Christy, um, they have a ministry called Nothing is Wasted Ministries. Uh, Davey's a, a widower as well. He was my first widower friend, and the way he's responded to his grief and his pain has just been is clearly inspiring to me, to Brittany, and to a lot of other people that follow along. So if our audience Googles nothing is wasted ministries, that's correct. they would be able to find all that content. Absolutely. Brittany, anything you would recommend? I would recommend? say Perspective Ministries, they put a lot of practical guides. It's not just for people walking through pain, but people that are walking alongside of people in pain. They put a lot of content of saying, hey, if your friend just lost their child, how to walk alongside of them. If they are walking through death of this way, these are some practical tips, but they are very gospel-centered. And that is perspective? Yep. Perspective Ministries. Perspective. So if you Google that, it should, come up. should pop yep. up. Good. And there's a lot of content out there. And I think the most important thing is, A, to just listen to the Holy Spirit and get into the Word, but also to have a godly counselor. Maybe it's a mentor that's pouring into your life. And I mean, we had counselors I would call all the time, like, my kids are doing this. What do I do? Am I leading them the right way? Because sometimes what you think is healthy is not really healthy. And so it's important to have other people speaking into your life, especially if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. 
So I have two questions, and I think it follows up on that perfectly, because I love you saying there's resources for people. I feel like in America, we don't always do grief very well. So when someone, when someone close to us has a family member die, we don't know what to do. So I feel like oftentimes we just do nothing or we back away. And so following up on the first question you answered, Daniel, I was wondering, you said people just showed up for you. I know, um, like from us talking to our friends, Jamie and Carissa, who her brother had died, he was like, people always ask us, what we, can we do for you? But he's like, we, can't, we couldn't answer that. We didn't have the energy to even know what to say. And so he said the people who were the most helpful were the people who just showed up, who just did things that mowed our lawn or whatever that we just needed, but we couldn't even think we needed. So when people like showed up for you, what are some tips you would give for people who are watching a loved one or a family member walk through grief, what do, what can they do that's helpful? Because I'm sure a lot they think, oh, I shouldn't bother them. They're grieving. or So they maybe back up. But what should they do that's actually taking steps forward that's helpful? Yeah, that's, that's an amazing question. You, the way I look at your support uh, in grief is, is circles. You know, You have your inner circle. You know exactly who those people are. They know they're in it. Then you have the extended family and friends circle, um, and then you have your community. And that's the way I would define those types of relationships. If you're in the inner circle, you have full access to show up unannounced in your PJs, go help, help with the kids, help with whatever's going on. You knock on the door or you just walk in and you can do that. If you are on the next layer out, the extended family, the friends don't do that. Don't show up unannounced at the door. Don't walk in and just demand that you're going to take care of laundry and dishes. It's going to be awkward. It's going to feel, ah, they may or may not tell you that. They may despair with it. So don't add additional stress to them. If you're in the community, then there's ways that you can help from an, a, a, a safer distance. That, that could be anything from just practical having groceries dropped off, gift cards to whatever. Or it can mean helping create memories for them. I mean, think about it. It, it, you, can, you can bless at different levels, but think about how can you create a place for them to go, you know, a, a cabin for them to get for the weekend, something where they can build new memories and go through it almost privately what they're dealing with, but you create a safe space for them. So if you identify where you are in those circles, then you know what access you have and the avenues you have to bless in that process. And we, we need the whole body. You know, God gave everyone different gifts, and we need those different gifts. You may have somebody that's gifted and encouraging, or you may have someone that is a prayer warrior. And man, that person is gifted. And I had people that would text me scripture, would text me prayers all the time, and that ministered to me so greatly. Maybe you do have someone that owns a business and a landscaping, and they could, you know, take care of your lawn for that. You have different gifts that God's given you, and I think using that, and so many times we think like, well, I can't, I mean, literally the other day we had a friend going through something and it was a crazy season and I couldn't make a big meal and I love cooking and I was like oh all I can do is make this loaf of bread <laughs> and so I was like Lord this is what I have today and yeah. so the whole time when I made this loaf of bread I was praying for them and I dropped it off and that was it and I just like this is what we have you know and they're gonna have seasons where you can give a card or a text or you might have a seasons where you can show up and do laundry but every one of us is in different seasons but all of us are called to serve in some way and so I would just say the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher and he knows the deepest needs. I mean, I had people that showed up at the right time, just in time, because they were the answer to God's prayer. I mean, one time on Mother's Day, literally, I'm bathing my boys, and I was mad. I'm like, I'm alone on Mother's Day, and why am I alone? My husband's gone. I was just mad. I was giving it to the Lord. I said, God, do you even see me right now? Do you even care? Literally seconds later, the doorbell rang. On Mother's Day, my friend that has five kids and lives 45 minutes away says, I know this is so weird, but an hour ago, God told me, get up and go to Brittany's house and say, I can help bathe your kids. And it was literally the exact moment what I needed to know that God cared. And the other day I texted her and I said, I just want you to know, I think of that all the time. And it reminds me that God sees me. And she said, do you know that I was arguing in my mind the whole time about going? I thought, she's not there on Mother's Day. She probably thinks it's weird if I say I'm going to help bathe the kids. And she's a good friend, but she was even struggling. So your inner circle can struggle with showing up. But she said, you know, I just thought, I have nothing to lose 
to obey God. I have nothing to lose. And so she showed up and forever, I will be reminded that God sees because she pressed through. I always say, you have to press through the awkward. You have to say, okay, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do this thing. And often that's when you are an answer to someone's prayer and God uses someone to show them that he really sees them. Yeah. So the second thing I would ask, um, so my sister last summer lost her uh, little boy, her baby that was stillborn birth. And I know how hard the first of everything is. You know, the first holidays you come across, the first, this is the day he would have been born, the first holiday now, you know, without him. So there is that first year that's just probably so tough. But I know there's a time in your heart where you really want to turn to hope, probably especially if you have children like she does. She has two little girls. So you're living in the pain, but you also want to live in hope. How did you start to find times to live in hope? How did you make the turn? Like for people who are grieving right now, uh, what were some things that helped you to find hope and joy again? Because I know grief is so hard. You live in the both and, like sad and joyful, and it feels weird sometimes to be both. So how did you start to find that hope and that joy again and nurture that um, in your own heart, but then for your family as well? Yeah, I remember coming up on the one year anniversary of Lindsay going home to heaven. And I put a lot of hope in that one year milestone. I thought something would feel different, more healed, more whatever, more hopeful. And I didn't, I felt more desperation almost. And the reason I share that is because I think we count on time to heal us and time doesn't heal anything. If we, if we back away from the storm, if we try to get around the storm, delay it, the storm is still there. You have to go through it. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded, I, I love just learning interesting facts, but um, bison of all things, um, God's programmed in their DNA that when, when a storm approaches them, they instinctually move towards the storm. They know that if I go towards it, that I'll get through it quicker. Wow. Instead of running from it and dodging it, we don't have that much sense most times, right? We just, <laughs> ah, it's scary. And I did the same thing. I got to that year mark and I'm like, it still hurts. It's still bad. And I realized, oh, it's not the time that heals me. It's confronting the fact that this is my reality and stop asking God why all the time and begin to ask God, what, well, what, what can I do in this season? What this new version of me that's refined by the fire, even though it doesn't feel like it feels like we're just being burned, but it's refined. What are we doing that will give glory to God? And are we willing to say yes to, to that answer that God gives us? Because when you do ask what, I've experienced an answer. I know other people will have that answer if they ask it. It's just getting the nerve to say, God, what do I do with this? I've got children watching me. I've got other people watching me. And it's not just for them. I need this personal, um, I need this for myself as well. So moving towards that what instead of a why, confronting the storm and not counting on time to make anything better. Um, that seems to, that's, that's helped me in the journey. So Brittany, before you answer the same question, I want to pause for a commercial break just to make sure I say what you said. Um, as I heard a pastor friend, to offer a word of discouragement, time does not heal anything. Is that, is that what you said? Is that what you said? Exactly. Time does not heal anything. Time heals nothing. Become like a bison, move towards the storm, um, because you got to get through it, not around it. Can't wait it out. It's coming. Well, and here's the risk too, is if you delay, and I've got friends, great friends that have admitted to that. Hey, Daniel, I'm five years in yeah. to my grief and I, I ran from it. I tried to dodge it. And here's the thing that's at risk. You hurt a lot of people yeah. if you would avoid it. Mm. Like there's a lot of wasted time and emotions and a lot of collateral damage that can happen if you delay going through that. It doesn't mean you have to be one day after a, a, a funeral or a whatever and just, oh, I'm going to. There is a process, in the, and there's a lot of grace for that process. But if you have every intention of avoiding that, that's when it becomes harmful. Brittany, how would you answer that same question when, when hurt began to turn towards hope? Yeah. You know, I think everyone's timeline is going to be different because again, time doesn't heal. God heals. So we experience people 10 years in that are bitter. Mm -hmm. They are dealing with self-pity, resentment, unforgiveness, and they are stuck in their pain. I think it's so important to look at Psalms 23, which says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say we build a house. It doesn't say we get comfortable there. It says we walk. And sometimes I was crawling and sometimes I was limping and sometimes it felt like all of my <laughs> arms didn't work, but I 
had to move. And so it's a process. Like he said, you can't go around it. So you have to go through it. And so I really believe like the Lord does a healing work. He is near to the brokenhearted and he is the only one that knows what that's going to look like. I distinctly remember one day picking blueberries with my boys and I felt like, whoo, I felt happy for one minute. What's weird is I used to feel that way all the time. And it was weird that I felt that feeling and thought I haven't felt that in a long time. And then it went away and I was like, oh, but it was hope. It had that little spark of joy that God gave me hope. And I remember one day I was watching my kids play in the front yard and I just felt like God just whispered, one day there will be more joy than sorrow. Just keep holding on. And so to everyone out there that is walking through pain, I just want to encourage you that one day there will be more joy than sorrow, but keep holding on. And you have to keep holding on to hope even when it hurts because it hurts to hope sometimes. Hope is offensive to some people because it's more comfortable for us to stay in this building that we've built in the valley of shadow death than to keep moving through this uncomfortable to, you know, he always says that grief, you're in different rooms and different stages. And it's uncomfortable to move to the next stage. But I'm telling you, there's so much victory, so much peace, so much joy that comes. And it comes through a relationship with Jesus. It just comes through that. And you won't be the same person. I'm a totally different person than I was even three years ago when I hung out with you guys because we have walked through suffering and suffering changes you, but it can change us in hard ways, but it changes us for the better because it gives us perspective that we need. I need that perspective shift every day. Y'all, I need it. I get so stuck in my worldly ways and earthly things. And we have to. Suffering has a way of waking you up to what matters. And I'm thankful for that. So instead of, you know, pushing off grief, sometimes when we have those hard grief days, I've learned to embrace them and say, God, just strip us down of this earthly so we can focus on the heavenly. So, So just to bring a little Holy Spirit fuel truth into what you just said and then to pull a little more out of what you just said. Scripture says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, which is why it's scary to hope. Because if you hope and you don't get it, it literally hurts your soul. It makes your soul sick. Um, What scripture on hope came to you or did you cling to when you thought, I don't have it, but I know it's coming. Mm -hmm. I I don't have it, but I know Jesus does it. I know I have him. Where, where, Where in the word of God did the message of hope rattle around in your soul? And well, it's not like Bible quizzing. You don't have no. to quote like the text in the reference, but. <laughs> no, I'm, a, I'm an encourager by nature. I love encouraging people, helping them out. And that was, that was always part of my DNA, my personality. And when everything happened, you know, it, it, the whole world flips upside down. But one of the verses that I clung to, one of the truths was in 2 Corinthians 1, where it talks about God comforting us and then asking us to comfort others. And it clicked for me. I'm like, okay, I know how to comfort. Well, I know how to encourage people. I'd, I'd never known how to comfort. I always said, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry is comforting to a certain level. If someone doesn't you know, connect with you and say, hey, you know, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Well, that's acknowledgement, that's good. But when you can say, I know, and I'm sorry, it changes everything. And so that spoke to my heart that Maybe God could use what he had given me as an encourager again, that even though I didn't feel it in those moments, that reality that God has comforted me and will continue to because grief is not just a one-time thing. It's, there's, there's miles and miles to go. And just because you go through something hard doesn't mean that's all you'll ever go through, unfortunately. So knowing that I would continue to need that comfort gave me the confidence to say, God, I, I receive that. I am, I'm very open to that comfort, but I also want to encourage others when I learn how to do this from you. And that began my journey towards a hope and a purpose again that started to outweigh the pain at some point. I, Psalms was my treasure, man. I landed in there every day. And in Psalms, it says, I will not die, but I will live and declare the mercies of God. And there were times where I looked around All my dreams, all my hopes were dead. My husband was gone. It felt like everything around me was dying and it felt like who I was was dying. And I literally would just stand on that promise. I remember walking through my house, just saying promises of God out loud. And I said, I will not die. I will live. And one day I will proclaim the mercies of God. Like one day we will be on the other side of this and my kids are gonna love Jesus. It talks about how 
great will be your peace and they will know um, the ways of God. And it talks about that scripture. And I heard about that. Um, I was reading one day and I said, I'm going to claim that for my boys, that one day they will have peace and they will hold the the, the gifts of God. And so I think proclaiming and literally saying, God, like, you promised to be a father to the fatherless, and we are holding you to that. <laughs> you promised to be a defender of the widow, and we are asking you to be this. It says in Psalms 27, I would have despaired unless I believed I would look on the goodness of God. And it says in the land of the living. Yep. Not the land of the dead, yep. not the land of bitterness and unforgiveness. This is the land of the living. And so, so many often times you have to remind yourself, we will be despaired unless we look and we believe we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And you have to borrow the faith of other people sometimes, or you have to stay that in faith. I mean, there's times where we are dealing with stuff with our kids now. And I will walk in prayer walk with scripture because I, my heart needs it. Our hearts need the words. You know, people will try to comfort you with words and they're so kind and they mean so much, but they don't have living words that the word does. I mean, God will comfort you and he will reach you in a place. I'm telling you, five minutes in the presence of God does more than a lifetime of being with people. It changes everything. So getting in that presence and having that word over you, man, it breathes life into a dead soul. So one of my best friends um, lost his father a couple years ago, and we walked through the Songs of Jesus, a daily devotional in the Psalms by Tim Keller. Uh, this year with our elders, I'm walking through a Warren Wearsby devotional, a, a year in the Psalms. Do you have a Psalms resource that is one of your go-to as you lived in the Psalms, or did you just open up the Word of God and just live right there? So you're going you're gonna to think this is crazy, <laughs> but so often in grief, you can't remember like, where do I even go or what day is it or whatever. So I have taught my kids this even now. So whatever day it is, I go to that number in the Psalms and then you add 30 to that and then you'll read through the whole Psalms in a month. So you just keep adding. So like if today was the first, I'd read the first and then I'd add 30 and read Psalms 31st and then I'd add another 30 and re you know what I'm saying? You just keep going. And I would just sometimes just read through it as much as you can. Sometimes you have it played over you because sometimes you can't even focus to read. So say that again for those of us who played football because I like that. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was really good. So every day you're going to read four-ish yes, or five something Psalms. Something like that. Tell yep. us, tell you. So today is, as we record this, podcast November 19th. So you're reading the 19th Psalm, yep. the 49th, the 79th, the 109th, the 139th, and, and there's not 169th. Yep. Mm. Okay. Listen to that math right there. That <laughs> See is that? That's I married that See man. that? What year did you guys get married? 20. <laughs> <laughs> well, in grief, memory Listen, is one of the first things that goes. <laughs> yeah. If you're just listening on the platform and you're not watching on YouTube, <laughs> Brittany cannot remember when she got married. Just For in case record. you don't get to witness it, yeah. Daniel's going to give it a shot? 2017. 2017, okay. Confidently. So <laughs> this will be Christmas number five as a blended family. Does the tension go away? Your five, is it figured out? yet? Time doesn't heal, remember. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's Jesus well, that heals. So it depends yeah. on what people put into it, you know? It yeah. really does. Uh, I will say is a, if we... Yeah, you're exactly right. Time is, is different for everybody, how much work you put into it. I've been told by many, well, several people, and I don't want to take it too hard, several people, and I agree with it, is for a blended family, it typically takes three years for you to kind of blend and merge and become, you know, a, a new dynamic. And I would agree with that in a lot of ways. It took us years to work through all of the different dynamics and internally. That's, and that's you and Brittany and that's just in our, under our roof. Right. Actually, I think it would take longer. I disagree I with that number. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. To be say? honest. What would you say? Yeah. I mean, I, man, I feel like. She's saying more than yeah, five. More than, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking so back to the days now, 27. She's saying <laughs> it takes more than five years. It takes so oh, much longer it than what you expect. encourager. Expect. <laughs> encourage it. Three years, yeah. guys, that's all that it takes. Yeah. I think, you know, the Lord does so much healing in our hearts when we do the hard heart work. Right. And I think in our home, it, after several years, we could feel a difference. In right. the hearts, we could feel a difference in just the unity of the family. I mean, one of our kids the other day was like, I don't want to go hang out with my friends on my birthday. I just want to make sure we have our special family time like we always do. And I was like, oh, my word. Yeah. Lord, you are doing such a work. Yeah. So I do think that it just depends on your situation of how long and how much work and prayers and honestly, how much freedom you got of releasing the pain 
that looks different and releasing expectations to pick up what the reality is and be thankful for the reality. So for those of you watching, uh, watching, listening a little longer than our normal podcast, um, I hope you understand. hope you've been enjoying the content. One final question, um, and then we'll wind down. If you could go back to um, Daniel on your wedding day, yeah. if you could go back to Brittany on your wedding day and give yourself one bit of advice about uh, doing blended family well, you would tell him what now knowing what you know and the same question for you, Brittany. I would tell him to be humble. You've never been here before. You don't know what you're doing. Lean heavily on wise counsel. Stay in the word and trust God with the process. That's something that I knew I didn't have it figured out, but I wanted to convince myself and everyone else around that I, I, I figured out other stuff. I'll get this. That's not the way to approach it. And that approach is like you talk about forgiveness hurt a lot of people uh, or some people because I just acted like I knew what I was doing to some level. Um, and confidence is great, but not in the situation where you have really don't know what you're doing. Right. Admit it, acknowledge it, seek wise counsel and approach that process with humility. Brittany, how would you answer that question if you could go back and tell yourself one thing about living in blended family? You would say what? I was going to say the exact same thing. Humble. You know, God gives grace to the humble and he despises the proud. And so I think when we have pride in our life, it really comes in between lots of things. And so I, I would definitely say just walk in humility and grace forgiveness and loving people well. Like I can't explain God's will for my life to other people, but I have to walk in it, but we can walk in it in humility. So on behalf of Danielle and I, thank you guys for spending some time um, on our podcast platform. Uh, Long before we were, um, you know, a pastor and his wife leading a congregation, um, we were people just just trying to love friends, uh, live in community. Um, Long before we were people with friends, we were um, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. And I think we have learned as um, sons and daughters and brothers and sisters how to, how to do how to do this better yep. um, as we approach people and as we approach friends and as we approach people in our congregation um, just by learning by sitting and listening today so we've we've not been hosts as much as we've been the audience today so thank you uh, for sharing your story with us uh, for those of you who've been listening to the activate podcast thank you so much for being with us today. Um, This is kind of part two of content that Daniel and Brittany shared with us. They were at our church in Lee Summit uh, on November 20th of 2022. Um, If you've got the internet handy, you can go to our website, takethejourney.cc. You can go to the watch and listen tab and you can listen to that interview, which which is totally different content, but about the same subject. And that will also connect you to their story that they told at Journey in 2019. But we're grateful that you've been with us today. We know scripture tells us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers. We're always trying to figure out how we take what we hear and do it practically. That is the purpose of our website. If you live in Kansas City, uh, we'd love for you to come be with us over Christmas. We've got five Christmas services this year, Thursday, December 22 at seven, uh, Friday, December 23 at five and seven. And then on Christmas Eve, we've got three at two, four and 6 p.m. You can find all of that on a website, Christmas at jci.com. We'd love for you to be our guest. And if you're listening today, you know at least two people. You know someone uh, who's hurting that you can be a better help to. Please send them this so that they can understand how to maybe a little better practically walk through their grief. And you have a friend who's trying to help someone who's hurting. Send it to each of them. Let this resource activate a big group of comforting comforters uh, in our community or in the community that you live in. Uh, And of course, if you subscribe to our podcast in early January, we'll be dropping a podcast on how to very practically read your Bible through um, and get a lot out of learning to walk with God every day in January of 2023. So thanks for being with us today. We always love for you to rate our podcast on whatever platform you listen to. That helps us get this content to more people, share it broadly so that the ministry of today will continue a really, really long time. Um, And once again, thank you for joining us uh, on Activate, where we challenge you to live a faith that is active. 
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Activate. We would love for you to join us in person for one of our weekly worship experiences. You can find out more information about JCI on our website at takethejourney.cc. Help us get the word out about this resource. You can do so by subscribing, reviewing, and sharing this episode on your favorite social media platform. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Activate Podcast.